nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, in the second example, we are going to investigate 1D photonic crystal. So a one-dimensional photonic crystal is made of periodic structure with alternating material and the thickness. The main characteristic of such a structure is that at a certain wavelength or frequency range, it can reflect almost all of the energy back. Nothing will transmit through this structure. Why is that? Because as the light hit the first interface, as you can imagine, part of the energy reflect back and the rest of them transmit through. And at the second, second interface, again, some energy reflect back, some transmits through. And the same for the third, fourth, fifth, blah, blah interface. And on the right frequency, the phase of uh, the reflected wave are in phase at every interface. So they add up constructively. However, the transmitted wave are out of phase. So they interfere destructively and cancel out. But that's why at, at this specific wavelength, nothing will transmit through the structure. Okay, let's use this as an example. We have a photonic crystal made of two material. Material one is vacuum with permittivity of one, and it has thickness 120 nanometer. Uh, layer two is, is made of a material with permittivity four, and it has a thickness 80 nanometer. And if we consider such a three period, six layer structure, um, here on the top right figure, we plot the reflectance of such a structure. We can see that uh, between 570, 750 uh, nanometer, it has a very high uh, reflectance re uh, region. If we further increase the number of periods to 20 periods, then this high reflection region almost has a, a, a unity reflectance. Right? It has a very sharp cutoff at around 500 nanometer and 750, and the reflectance is almost unity. So now let's use S4 tool to investigate a six, uh, three period, six layer structure for simplicity. And I will leave it to you to investigate more period. Okay, we have opened up a new S4 window. We are gonna keep using graphical interface for this example. Let's define the material. Again, we have two materials. Material one is vacuum. Material two, again, we uh, set this material manually. It has a permittivity equal to four. Let's go to layer. Um, for this example, again, we don't really care about the basis vector. And uh, we have six layers, three period in this, in this uh, example. And our top layer is a semi-infinite vacuum layer. And this time we want to copy our top layer as the bottom layer. So we check yes here, okay? So that uh, the bottom layer will be automatically made of material one. Now let's go to layer one. Layer one is made of material one. It has a thickness 120. Layer two is made of material two. It has a thickness 80 nanometer. Layer three, again, material one, 120 nanometer. Layer four, material two, 80 nanometer. Layer five, material one, 120 nanometer. And layer six, material two, 80 nanometer. All right, here's the layer definition. Now let's go to simulation detail. Uh, for this example, we can use more Fourier function, maybe 50. And we want 
um, normal incidence. We want normal incidence, so phi and theta are both zero. Um, and this time, actually, for normal incidence, it doesn't really matter whether it's S or P polarization if there's no pattern in the XY plane. So for simplicity, we set S polarization component to be zero. And the reduced unit, again, we set default. And the wavelength range, we want it start from 100 nanometer to 1000 nanometer at a step two nanometer, okay? And we don't want to smooth the resulted curve, we chose no. All right, then we are ready to go. All right, we have already got the result. There are three curves. The blue curves on the top is the incident flux. It has been normalized to one. And the red curves here is the reflection flux. As we can see, there's a very high reflection peak or, um, between 500 and 750 nanometer. And the green curve is the transmission flux. We have been using the graphical interface to work out the previous two examples. And what does the graphical interface do? It simply transforms your input to a control file. And actually the graphical interface is less flexible than S4 itself. For example, in S4, you can run a structure with many, many layers but uh, in this graphical interface, it only allows at most 10 layers. So to fully utilize the feature of S4, we need to understand how to write our own control file. So to start with, let's go to the control file and download this file. Here we have already uh, open up the file downloaded from NanoHub. And uh, I made some small modification by adding a few comments so that it's easy to read. Now let's uh, go over at this file line by line. Okay, what does the control file do first? On line one, it creates a new simulation object the syntax is s 4new simulation. It's similar to object-oriented programming like Python or C++. And you, uh, there's a class S4, and you call the constructor function new simulation to create a new object and pass it to the variable s. And on line two and three, we define the lattice basis vector x1, y1, and x2, i2. You are probably confused why our x1 is 270 nanometer. Why is it three in the control file? We will come back to it later. And we set the number of basis functions on line four. Next, we define the materials. On uh, line six, uh, we first define the first material vacuum. Uh, it, its real part is one, imaginary part is zero. On line eight, we have material two, real part and imaginary part of permittivity. Next, let's define all the layers. Uh, from line 10, 10 to 13, we define the top layer, it's called layer above, and it's made of vacuum. And since it's a semi-infinite top layer, the thickness is zero. And then let's look at line 21. Instead of defining a new semi-infinite bottom layer, we copy the top layer to the bottom layer because they are made of the same material, okay? The new layer is called layer below and it's copied from layer above and it has thickness zero because it's semi-infinite. And from line 14 to 19, 
we define the six layers for the alternating structure. Layer one, layer two, three, four, five, and six, they are made of vacuum material two, alternatively. And again, you might be confused. Hey, our, the thickness of our first layer is supposed to be 120 nanometer. Why is this 1.3333? Again, we'll come back to it later. And next, we need to specify the excitation mechanism. We call the function set excitation plane wave. On line 26, we specify the incident angle phi and theta. On line 29, we specify the amplitude and phase of the S polarization component. And similarly, on line 30, we specify the P polarization component. Next, we need to create some arrays before sweeping over all the frequency. Um, our wavelengths runs from 100 to 1000 nanometer at the step 2 nanometer. So we first create um, a frequency array that encompasses all the frequencies we need to calculate. So you might be confused. Hey, our wavelengths like it, uh, it's from 100 nanometer to 1000 nanometer, why the frequency start from 0 0.9 and uh, goes down. This has something to do with the reduced unit in S4, and again, we will come back to it later. And on lines 33 to 37, we define the array for the material constant. Why do we do that? Because of here we set our material to be dispersionless. That is, its um, optical property is independent of frequency. But in real world material, almost all the materials are dispersive. That is, their permittivity is dependent on frequency. So you have to create a ray uh, to set the optical property for each frequency we want to calculate. And finally, we loop over all the frequency. So since there are a total of 451 frequency, we have a loop index i running from 1 to 451. On line 40 and 41, we specify the operating phase frequency by calling set frequency function. And on line 43 and 44, we reset the material properties and again, this is for dispersive media only. And actually for this example, we don't have to um, write these two lines. And the most important part is to uh, obtain the, the desired output. We first call a function get pointing flux to retrieve the pointing flux at the top layer with z offset zero. The first output is the incidence flux and the second output is reflection flux. And on line 48, we normalize the reflection flux by the incident flux so that the reflectance runs from zero to one. And why do we put a, a minus one in front of it? Because the reflection flux has the opposite direction compared to the incident flux. So we have to put a negative sign in front of it to cal calibrate it. And similarly, on uh, line 50, we um, get point flux at the bottom layer. And this time we only need one output that is transmission flux. We omit the second output because the second output uh, stands for the back incidence. However, in this structure, we have no excitation on the bottom. So we simply don't need the second output. And again, on line for, uh, 51, we normalize the transmission flux by the incidence flux. And on line 53, we, we normalize incidence flux itself so that uh, it must be one at all frequencies. Finally, on line 55, we print the output. It will be printed like a CSV-like file. And the first column is frequency, Second column is incidence flux, third column is reflection flux, and the last column is transmission flux.
Next, let's talk about the reduced unit in S4. So uh, we have already learned that uh, um, uh, in SI unit, uh, frequency times wavelength is equal to the speed of light. And in S4, speed of light is assumed to be one, so that the frequency is simply the inverse of wavelengths. And uh, sometimes it's, it's a little bit cumbersome to deal with like absolute unit. For example, if we have a structure with a thickness one micro, then we have to type 0 0.000001 meter. That's uh, very cumbersome. So in S4, we use, we set a normalization constant to normalize all the lengths. For example, if you remember, we set the, the reduced unit, uh, we set the normalization constant to be default in the previous example. And uh, in this graphical interface, by setting default, the normalization constant is set to be 0 0.9 times the minimum wavelengths. So in this example, it's 90 nanometer. Then everything is normalized by this constant. For example, our wavelengths runs from 100 nanometer to 1000 nanometer. So we divide each of them by 90 nanometer. Then we have the wavelengths in reduced unit. And then we take the inverse of wavelengths, we get the frequency in reduced unit. So that's why you can see that in the frequency array, we have uh, the first element is 0 0.9, the second element is 0 0.88, and down to, I guess, 0 0.9. And similarly, we need to scale our uh, basis vector. We divide um, 270 nanometer by 90 nanometer, which is 3. So that's why our x1 is 3 in reduced unit. Our y2 is also 3. And finally, we need to normalize the layer thickness. We divide uh, both d1 and d2 by 90 nanometer so that uh, the layer thickness for the for layer one is 1.333 in reduced unit and the thickness for layer two is 0 0.8889 in reduced unit.